So thanks everyone for inviting me. I'm very excited to give this keynote and uh, just being invited by your community. I think that's a, a great honor and I hope that we'll have some exchange also maybe after my talk. So I'm not quite sure how far away I can be from the mic. So just uh, people in the back, let me know in case you can't hear me. I have a pretty loud voice, even though I'm not so tall, but <laughs> I might not be able to read. Uh, everyone in the back. Okay, so just a uh, shout out and if you have questions also feel free to ask. I'm happy to take questions during my talk. Um, I have prepared some material uh, and depending on how, how long we'll take I might be skipping some of the more technical slides but we'll see. All right, okay so the title, okay yeah, uh, Ifan also asked me to uh, introduce my name, so it's Stephanie Balzer. <laughs> so it's uh, I'm Swiss, so in Swiss German you'd say Balzer, but I guess in, in the US I usually go by Balzer. All right, and the title of my talk is Shared Session Types for Safe Practical Concurrency. So basically for every word that appears in the title has a meaning and hopefully at the end of this talk you all uh, agree with me that that's a feasible approach for uh, concurrency that uh, provides safety, but is also practical, so can be used, even though it, it's, it comes from, from academia. I guess I don't really have to motivate uh, in this crowd that concurrency is important and it's ubiqui ubiquitous. So it's in our, the world that surrounds us is inherently concurrent, right? So why I'm giving this talk here, maybe somewhere in this building or close by there's a student studying. There's a coffee shop, I'm sure, somewhere down the street. People are gathering, having, enjoying a nice a cup of coffee. Uh, there's maybe, today it's maybe too cold, but maybe some people still like to eat some ice cream and enjoy it. Someone is petting his dog. So this all goes on concurrently, but it doesn't really stop there. Also. And many programming problems that we deal with today, they are inherently uh, in uh, concurrent. So, for example, a flight booking system, even an online store. But again, it doesn't stop there. Also, our programming devices, or computing devices are inherently concurrent. Just take your smartphone, right? You have sim uh, multiple uh, applications running on it at the same time. So, take away really, we can no longer go by with a programming language that does not support concurrency. But we all know concurrent programming is intricate. It's very, very difficult and it's nasty if we do not take any precautions. Well, just to set the scene, so there are essentially two models of when it comes to concurrent programming. So one is the shared memory approach and the other is the message passing approach. So with the former, we basically have all the applications that are running or all the threads that are running share a common store and they interact through that common store. So by reading from the store and writing to the store. Then on the other hand, in the message passing approach, we do not have shared data, but uh, threads or components, concurrently executing components, interact with each other by sending messages to each other. So a lot of people agree that message passing concurrency provides a high level of abstraction, in particular because it abstracts over the details of how uh, basically instructions compile to machine instructions. And because of this, it's actually quite a widely adopted approach. Even in languages like Erlang, Go and Rust, they really use message passing concurrency. All right, and that brings me now to my research. So the goal of my research is to make concurrent programming safe and practical. And in order to do this, I focus on the message passing model. And I use a, a, a notion of type, which is called session type, that provides a mean to express at the type level the protocols that emerge from message exchange. So we get the static guarantee of protocol adherence. And because we 
uh, delimit how components interact with each other by the type, we then, as a benefit, can focus and reason about each individual component sequentially. So the contributions of my work that I'm going to talk about today are the notion of shared session types, and it will become clear in a minute what exactly I mean by this. Um, really important is because we support sharing, we now can accommodate scenarios that previously could not be accommodated uh, in, at the same guarantees uh, in existing approaches. And these guarantees are really very strong ones. So it's protocol adherence. So at compile time, we are guaranteed that the protocol is adhered to. We don't have any data races, both low level and high level. And in addition, uh, we also guarantee deadlock freedom. All right, so let me step into session types and basically motivate what are session types, provide you the intuitions for those of you who haven't heard yet, even though I know that I guess in the Scala community in particular, quite a lot of people actually already know about it or in connection with the actor model. But anyways, uh, let me give you an intuitive introduction to session types and also motivate why we need session types in practice. So it's not really, hopefully you agree with me, an academic exercise. So for this, I would like to look at Servo. So Servo is uh, a browser engine developed by Mozilla that is currently under development and it should maybe in the future become the, the next browser engine they're going to use. And it's implemented in Rust and they use message passing concurrency to parallelize many of the tasks that are currently executed sequentially in existing web browsers. So in particular, this can be the loading and rendering of images. So let's look at the main component there in, or one of the components in Servo, which is the image loader. So the central component, component in the image loader is the image cache. So that's a component that runs in its own thread, but it interacts with other components that are also running in their own threads, which are here the CMD receiver and the client. And then even more, so, so essentially from the CMD receiver, the image cache receives like uh, page load requests and the client basically can ex uh, terminate or basically end the image cache. Then for the actual loading, uh, the image cache uses the resource thread and then for the rendering, it spawns uh, its own decoders. So for each uh, uh, image that gets rendered, there's a decoder running. Okay, so let's play a little bit with this scenario. So as I said, Rust uses uh, message passing concurrency. So that means all the interactions happen along channels, which I show here in this diagram where, where, uh, using those uh, connected lines. There's also a legend at the, uh, at the bottom of my slide and I carry through this uh, principle through my entire talk, okay? Okay, so now let's uh, imagine that a CMD receiver sends a load request to the image cache. So that can go ahead and now there could be another exchange between the client that asks the image cache to exit or alternatively the client could also send the kill message to the resource thread in order to shut down the resource thread. Okay, so that's basically how those guys interact with each other. Well, Rust and, and Servo in particular, they already are quite disciplined in the sense that given that they exchange messages, they use enumeration types to make sure that only messages of the appropriate type can be exchanged. So let's look at how the connection or the channel or the interactions to image cache are typed in, in Servo. So for this, we have this enumeration, which is called the image cache command. And I don't really expect you to read everything in detail. So let me just walk, walk you through and point out the important bits. So here you can see that for each kind of message that can be exchanged, there's a variant in the enum type. 
So for example, there's a request image and it takes some arguments. Actually, all of those or most of them take a URL, which is just a string that dis describes the URL, right? Or there is also the possibility to have a channel as an argument where we then can basically send an acknowledgement along this channel once we are done, let's say, loading or whatever. All right, the really important part I would like you to catch on this slide, I already said that, is this line here, which is actually a comment. It says, clients must wait for a response before shutting down the resource thread. So, well, what does it mean, right? We saw that earlier the client can um, send an exit request to the image cache, but it also can go ahead and kill the resource thread. So, if we are not very careful, and we've, in particular, if a programmer does not adhere to this comment, then what can happen is that the client goes ahead, shuts down the resource thread, and the image cache is still waiting uh, basically to receive input from the resource thread and might wait indefinitely. So what we he see here is an implicit protocol that is not enforced by the typing in Rust. And if that protocol is not adhered to, well, what can happen is basically a profileration of panic in Rust, or things just kind of wait indefinitely, okay? So, well, we, we see, or I guess you hopefully all agree with me, that enumeration types actually ensure that messages of the appropriate, appropriate type are exchanged, but that's it. In particular, with enumeration types only, we cannot ensure that the messages are sent according to the protocol that we have in mind when we write the code. Okay, so that's session types. Let me show, give you now a slight quick introduction into session types. So what's the basic idea? And then we'll, we'll write together, or I'll show it to you, that the, this protocol in session types that we are not able to express. In, in Rust. Okay, so session types basically uh, define the protocols of message exchange. So what do I need, mean by a protocol? Well, essentially, a protocol is a sequence of actions. And we use the following types to describe those uh, possibilities. I'll walk you through it so don't get scared, and then we'll, we'll look at an example together. Uh, it's maybe a weird notation, but the, the reason for this is being that it's based on linear logic. And I'll, I'll say more about this uh, later on, but first I just want to get the intuitions across because this is really easy. Okay, so essentially we have the possibility uh, when we define a session type to give a choice of messages. So there's the so-called external choice which provides a choice of sending any of the labels li uh, to the client. So the, 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 the component offering an exchange according to that session type. Dually, we also have an internal choice. Here it's not the client that chooses to send any of the labels li, but it's the provider, the implementer, who chooses, picks any of those, those messages li. Then in session types, we can communicate other channels along channels. It's similar to sending um, like a, a, a pointer or a reference, right, in, 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 in Scala as an argument. I, I mean not sending, I mean passing a uh, point of reference as an argument. Okay, so again we have this dual notion of who sends. So with a channel input, it's the client who sends the channel. With the dual, the channel output, it's the provider that's going to send the channel. Lastly, we also have the possibility to just terminate a component that is running and we use this one type for this. And in addition, you might wonder, well, all I can do right now is pass channel re references around and, and, and send labels. Well, of course, we can also pass around base values. 
So for this, just imagine that we have in our languages, we support type strings in booleans and so on. And then we can uh, also um, send a value of that type along a channel, either the client or the provider. Okay, so now we have those types. And let's now go back to our image cache that we looked at earlier in Rust. And let's try and figure what the protocol should be in terms of a session type. We already know the protocol, right? But now let's capture that using session types. And we have the connecti connectives on the top. So, well, at the outset, the, this channel should provide the possibility to send any of the variants that we saw earlier in the enumeration type, right? So we are giving the client a choice to pick any of those, so we use an external choice for that matter. Now for each variant we had previously in the session type, we have a corresponding label. And I just didn't bother about listing all of them, also because of space restrictions on my slide. So I'm just going to focus on, on two. So previously, we remember, we had the request image as one option. And the other option was the exit that was used by the client. All right, so let's now, because I have not filled in everything yet, but at the outset, we have a external choice such that whoever interacts with the image cache can either send the request image label or the exit message. So now if the client chooses to request an image, well, then after that exchange, the protocol is as follows. It's the string input requester lolly image cache command. So when we look at the types above, we can see that the protocol is after having received the request image, the client has to send a URL, so something of type string. Then the protocol transitions and it's now expecting a channel that indicates whoever requested the load so that we can send an acknowledgement along that channel. And then after that, we just recurse. So let's now look at the more interesting variant, which is the exit. Well, here now we use an internal choice, and that's maybe something that might be new or partly new. I, I mean, in functional languages, we somehow have it due to a data type. So what I'm alluding to is essentially the option that not only the client can choose something but also the provider. So here in particular, when image cache receives the exit request from the client, it tells the client whether it's running or it's done. So that's where we use the internal choice, right? So if image cache is still loading and rendering images, it will send back to the client, hey, I'm still running, and then it recurses. On the other hand, if it's done, it will send back to the client, I'm done, and it will send it a channel reference to the resource thread so that the client then can go ahead and terminate the resource thread. Okay, so, Let's play with that protocol and just to, to take some moment to have it sink in. So we now look at the image cache and any exchange with uh, command rec uh, CMD receiver and client. So let's assume we start out in, in the case that image cache is now of type image cache command. So it offers a session that I have here on the top of the slide. Okay, so what does it mean? It, it's now in a state where it accepts any labels or messages of either request image or exit. Let's now imagine that CMD receiver actually sends a request image. Okay, so now think for a moment what happens now after that exchange. Well, as a result of this exchange, we have advanced the protocol, right? So that means that now image cache 
expects to receive a URL of type string. So that means its type has changed. Well, okay, let's assume now command receiver is now doing this, sends uh, the, the, the URL. Well, after this exchange, again, the session type of image cache changes. It's now expecting to receive a channel next. Let's imagine that it does that. So it's following the protocol. And now at this, at this point, after this exchange, we're back again to being, the, the, the image cache is back again to being an image cache command. Let's now look at the client. At this point, the client sends the exit request. Well, now the type of image, ca of, uh, image cache is of the internal choice, indicator, indicating whether it's still running or whether it's done. Well, we see that there's still decoder running, so it will actually tell the client now, hey, I'm still running. And it will, I think I did I step to, no, no, exactly, I didn't miss anything. So, uh, and now it returns. Okay, so the big takeaway here is that unlike in other, I guess, more traditional programming languages where variables of a certain type do not change their type at runtime. Here in session type programming, this is the case. So values change their type along with the protocol. Okay, are there any questions up to here? I, I know we are a big, big uh, yeah, please. You could do that if you wanted. Uh, uh, you could send a tuple or so that contains all the information. But uh, bear in mind that I wanted to find an example that is a good one to put on a slide. <laughs> so, and I jump, I'm just, um, I could have done that, but I then wouldn't have been able to show you several connectives I wanted to show you. Yeah. But absolutely, you can do that. If you have tuples in your programming language, then that's no issue. OK, so let me take SOC so far. So we have seen that the session types make explicit the protocols of message exchange. And they ensure protocol adherence. And also, they make explicit how components, concurrently compo executing components, are dependent on each other. And as a result, they then allow us to reason about each concurrently executing component sequentially. Well, given this, it really sounds like, let me say, a fit made in heaven, right, between message passing concurrency and session types. Well, and because of this, there is actually quite a lot of attention uh, devoted to uh, session types. So, of course, in academia, but also in practice. So, um, well, let me start out with research. So, essentially, uh, session types got born in the 1990s. So, Koe Honda introduced them as a means to basically indicate or express those protocols of message exchange, but in the setting of the typed pi calculus, which is a process calculus. So it's a formal model of concurrent programming. And then in 2010 and 2014, session types have been put on a very firm logical foundation by discovering a Curry-Howard isomorphism between, which is just basically a formal correspondence between linear logic and the message passing and, and session typed pi calculus. Okay, so that's, that's basically the, the academic background. Well, those linear session types that were introduced in 2010 and 2012, they are very appealing because they provide a lot of guarantees. 
However, they rule out certain programming scenarios that cannot be accommodated. And this is where my work comes in, where we have basically extended the practicability of linear session types by introducing sharing, uh, but still maintaining the guarantees. And I'll talk about this uh, just now in, after this slide. Uh, just let me point out that session types have received quite some attention also in practice. So there are various lightweight integrations uh, or also library-based uh, approaches to session types for languages like Scala, uh, even though I think the ACA library is more like using the actor framework, but there are others also. And then Java, Haskell, or Camel, Go. There's also a session type library in Rust, which was developed by some master students, which and they explored it a little bit uh, for even servo, but it's not used right now. I'm also having a collaboration with Mozilla Research, where we actually then are um, trying to integrate uh, the results of the work uh, into Rust. Okay, so let me talk about uh, the work that I've been doing, which are, which I coin as logic-based shared session types. Well, before I can really dive into this, I have to give you some ideas what the benefits and also drawbacks are of linear logic session types. Well, as I have said, they provide very strong guarantees because of their logical foundation. These guarantees in particular are data race freedom, protocol adherence, and also deadlock freedom. And all this comes by the typing, okay? Well, just to give you some idea, why do we get data race freedom and protocol adherence? It's because of linearity, which makes sure that there's always exactly one client. Then for the deadlock freedom, in the, in the work that is based on the so-called intuitionistic linear logic, that's the work that is the, uh, it's basically the basis of my work. In here, we have the guarantee that on, at runtime, processes do actually not just form an ar arbitrary graph or the concurrently executing components, but they form a tree. And you can imagine, in a tree, there are no cycles, so obviously, that's good for deadlock freedom. The problem, however, is that those very strong approaches rule out sharing. So in particular, it means that we could not ac accommodate the example that we just looked at. Because here, image cache has several clients. I mean, clients, not the client I have here on the image, but it interacts with, with several components. So it interacts with CMD receiver and also client. If we were to use linear types, it could only have either of the two. Okay, so, well, now the challenge basically is to support that scenario, but at the same time, maintain all the guarantees that we got from linear session types. And as you might imagine, that's actually quite a challenge. Well, it's always good to understand the problem because before you try to attack it, right? So let's figure out what is really, what are the, day, the, the threats when we introduce sharing? What are the challenges? Well, let's look at our example again. So we start out with, CM, with image cache and uh, offering a, se a session of type image cache command. Now let's assume that CMD receiver goes ahead and makes a request. At this point, image cache is of type string input request lolly image um, cache command, right? So let's now imagine that the client goes ahead and sends the exit request. And as you can see, this is a violation of the protocol because image cache expects to receive a string but it actually gets an exit request. So the question now is, how can we restore protocol adherence in the presence of aliasing, right? Well, there are a couple of ingredients to the solution. And the first one is 
to adopt an acquire release policy. Well, it's an old idea, right? Clients have to run in mutual exclusion from each other in, in, when they interact concurrently with a shared component. So the idea then would be if a client acquires a shared component, it gets exclusive access to it, and then once it's, then it can go ahead and interact with the component according to the linear protocol that we just have seen, and once it's done, it releases it. Okay, so let's play with this idea. So now I basically ac uh, account for the sharing, and I have now connected all the components with dotted lines that uh, signifies that these are sh all shared channels. Okay, so now if everyone plays by the rule, if CMD receiver were to interact with image cache, it first has to acquire it. So let's do this, it, it's going to acquire it. So now as a result of this, it gets back a unique access point, an exclusive access point to image cache, which is here illustrated by a linear channel. So note that this is the only connection that is solid. So that's a linear channel. And everyone else is still connected by, by a share channel, which means they all would have to acquire first if they are all well behaving. So we essentially now are entering a critical section. Once we are done communicating with image cache, we are releasing it, or CMD receiver is releasing it, and at this point it gets back a shared connection. So that's the idea. So the question is now, if we have this acquire release policy and everyone plays by that rule, the question is, is that enough to restore protocol adherence? So let's play with it. Well, we are again in this scenario. We start out with image cache command. Now CMD receiver acquires, as it's supposed to do. It gets back a linear connection to image cache, and now it goes ahead and interacts according to the protocol. So it's requesting the image at this point now, uh, image cache is expecting a string, right, if it were to continue interacting, but actually CMD receiver decides, no, I'm done, I'm releasing, someone else can it take its turn. And now we're still at type string input request lolly image cache command, and now the client goes ahead and wants to send its exit request. So it plays by the rule, it acquires the session type, uh, the image cache, and now it goes ahead and sends the exit, and boom, we still have a violation. Well, what, what are we missing? Well, I hope you all agree with me, it's still valid to do this acquire release, but it's only one part of the solution. So the second ingredient to the solution is the notion of an equisynchronizing session type. And that sounds like a mouthful, but let me explain. So in addition to requiring that clients first acquire um, a session before, and before they interact with it and then release it, we also have to make sure that if a client ever releases a session, it has, or a channel, it has to release it back to the same type at which it, got it, it, at which it acquired it. Because we have aliasing here, right? All the possible clients have to agree on the same type. Otherwise, we don't get protocol adherence or also called preservation. So, this sounds like a lot to, to keep in mind. So, let me illustrate it based on an example, because the idea is very simple. Again, let's look at our session type. And here, let's assume that we acquire the session type at this point, so when it's still image cache command, before we do anything. Well, given that we have acquired it at image cache command, 
Obviously, this release point here would be a fine release point because that's where we recurse. And the channel goes back to offering a session of image cache command. Similarly, also down here will be a fine release point because, again, we're equisynchronizing. We release it at the type we've acquired it before. What we did previously, however, that's not an okay point to release, right? Okay, so now if we put those two things together, acquire release and echo synchronizing, we get protocol adherence. And I hope you agree with me intuitively, but of course we had to prove that. Um, in addition, which is, is very interesting, actually, um, is that, I, to be honest, I, I knew it kind of, but I really only understood it when I was preparing this talk, uh, because we get actually even absence of uh, high-level data races. I'm not sure, but there's, there's some distinction in the community between low-level data races, which are typically formulated in the context of a shared memory um, dyna uh, semantics, where it means that if you have um, several reads and writes on the same location, but there is also the notion of a high-level data race, which basically says, well, like typically, so uh, Cormac Flanagan, I think, was introducing that in particular with the idea, let's say you have, take your bank account, and before you deposit, you check whether the balance is, is positive. So if you have those things now running concurrently, and if the checking and then the, the, the basically uh, deducting something, withdrawing something, if those two things are not happening atomically, you get uh, into trouble, right? That's the notion of a high-level data race. And in message passing concurrency, you are uh, prone or, I mean, there's nothing that prevents you from getting into a, a high-level data race. So, but here, because we have an acquire release discipline and also the notion of equisynchronizing, which requires us to basically release a type at its recursion point, it means that we restore any invariance that we impose on the type. Okay. So the question is now, how, what do we do with it? Well, one option would be to just take acquire, release, and equisynchronizing and impose it on the programmer as a programming methodology. But we're here at type level, so I won't have to fight for this, right? Well, we have types. They are great because they provide us a compile time verification and well, we already have session types, right? Linear session types. So why don't we just add the notions of acquire release and equisynchronizing to incorporate it into type, so lift it to the type level. And that brings us to the, to the notion of manifest sharing, which means that the equisynchronizing and the acquire release policy manifests in the type structure. Okay, so I have now here, oops, I'm not sure. Actually, what I'm showing is not what is on my, or showing on my screen. Let me briefly exit and see what's going on. Uh, okay, so for some reason, I saw something else. Um, so we were here, um, give me just one second, so I, huh, yeah, 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 it's, but I don't understand what is going on here. Okay, so I, I'll just continue. You see, now that's, uh, oh, okay, so, all right, so. Okay, I apologize for this. I think I confused myself. So anyway, what I wanted to say, I'm, I'm going to dive a little bit deeper right now, but I will at some point skip so that I have um, 
um, more time for, for the rest to talk about the log freedom. The little star on the slide is basically to warn you now it's getting a bit more um, technical. But the fundamental idea is now that we observe that we have acquire and release points and they essentially result into um, delimit the phases in which a component is linear and in which it is shared. So I have shown this here, or I'm showing this here on the slide by using two colors. So I use the light pink to denote when a type or a component in, it's in its shared mode and the blue highlight when it's in its linear mode. So we can now take this and basically say, okay, let's go with an adjoint formulation of our type system. Well, what we do is essentially we stratify our types into linear types and shared types. So the linear types here do have all the connectives you've seen previously. And now we basically connect the two layers by modalities. One modality which is, which is an up arrow that takes a type or a proposition from the linear layer to the shared layer and the inverse one, the dual, which takes a shared proposition to the linear one. And in addition, since we have shared channels now, we are also going to allow to communicate shared channels. And for this, I have those two connected, the exists and the pi. And that's basically our type system. So now when we take this type system where we have those two levels and we have linear and shared types, and we look again at our session type. And I've already highlighted the phases the type is in. So now when you look at this and you look at the connectives, you see that here we have to put an up arrow, right? Because what comes is linear, but at the outset we are shared. So we take it from the linear to the shared level. And then similarly at the recursion points, we first have to shift down. Okay, so now basically, lifting this idea to the type level, we now get basically for free that those two modalities denote acquire and release. So what I want you to take away from this slide is essentially that the types now tell us when we have to acquire and when we have to release, and that's indicated by those up and down arrows. Okay, so let me move forward because I have some more uh, technical slides, but I want to uh, now basically move on to the next part. So we have now a type system basically that allows us to have linear and shared channels to coexist and we get data race freedom and also the guarantee of protocol adherence. So you might wonder, what about deadlock freedom? Well, unfortunately, with the system right now that I've shown you, we don't get that guarantee anymore because essentially we introduced a locking discipline. But before I tell you what the issue is, I'd like you to understand why in the linear fragment, if, you, if we only have linear session types, in the intuitionistic setting, why we do get deadlock freedom for free? Well, the reason for this is linearity, which makes sure that there's always exactly one client. And as a result of this, we get actually a tree of processes or concurrently executing components at runtime. So in here, the parent is a client and the child is a provider. So the child is the one offering a session. So again, I use here the, the uh, solid lines to denote linear channels. And so let's now think for a moment, what are the threats to progress in such a system? And you might wonder, I just said, well, there's no, there are no deadlocks, but 
there are still potential threats because we do message passing concurrency and the type denotes the synchronization points, which means that with components interact, one might be ready to talk to an, one guy, but the other guy might be talking to someone else and is, so the, fir, the former has to wait. So in particular, there are two scenarios. One scenario is that a provider is ready to synchronize, but the client is not. The other scenario is the other way around. Well, let's visualize this uh, uh, dependency using a green arrow where A points to B if A is waiting to synchronize with B. Well, you can imagine a scenario here where we have the following green edges in our graph. So currently, uh, G is waiting for D, D is waiting to synchronize with A, A is waiting to synchronize with B. But C and A, they're, um, uh, sorry, but E is not waiting for B. So for example, E and B could be talking with each other, right? So what is important to note is even though there are possible waiting dependencies, we cannot form a circular dependency. And the reason for this being that those green arrows can only go, on, go along the, the, the edges in the tree because they denote a waiting due to synchronization. And the other thing is to a, pro, a client and a provider, they cannot both be waiting for each other, right? So there's no way for us to in, uh, introduce a cycle. So now, when we add sharing, we actually no longer get a tree, right? At runtime, we now have a graph. In this graph, we still find embedded a linear tree. And I denote this again with the color coding. So I use the light blue for the, the, the nodes or the components that are currently offering linear sessions and the purple ones that are offering shared sessions, and solid lines to denote linear channels, and uh, uh, dotted ones to, to denote shared channels. Okay, so I said, if we introduce a choir release now, we basically get locking. That means everyone knows, right? We have the possibility of cyclic dependencies. So again, let's now visualize the waiting due to the locking. And I used for this a red arrow. And in order to think about circular dependencies when it comes to locking, actually the right way to think about this, it, it is not that I'm waiting to acquire something, but I'm actually waiting for someone else who has acquired something and I'm waiting for that guy to release it. So the A points to B with a red arrow if A waits for B to release the resource. So let's imagine that B is actually trying to acquire C. So we have a dotted line connecting B to, with C. But A is holding C. So we can have now a red arrow connecting B to A because B is waiting for, to, for A to release C. Similarly, A can be waiting for D to release G, and D can be waiting for B to release E, and we get a cycle. So important to note is, as opposed to green arrows that can only go within uh, the, the tree, along the edges, the red arrows actually can go across the entire tree. Well, I want to finish by basically uh, show you that what the obvious soli solution would be is unfortunately not sufficient in session type uh, programming. Well, we all know since Dijkstra uh, reporting on dining philosophers, right? So the idea essentially that in order to prevent deadlocks, we just impose a partial order on the resources and then make sure that we lock up. So we acquire them or lock them in increasing order. 
Well, unfortunately, this is not sufficient when it comes to session types. And in particular, it's not sufficient because we have two forms of weighting in session types. Earlier, I introduced two arrows, right? There's the green arrow that demonstrates or signifies waiting to synchronize, and there's the red arrow for waiting uh, to release a resource. So given those two arrows, we have a scenario that we've just seen, but in addition, we have this scenario where we get a cycle because here in this example, B is waiting for, to synchronize with A, A is waiting to synchronize with D, and D is waiting for B to, the re uh, to release the resource E. So as a result, we get cycles that consist, can consist of both gray, uh, read and gray, red and green arrows, and that's quite a challenge. Um, so I'm happy to talk about uh, how we address that challenge, <laughs> uh, but I don't have time anymore in this talk. So in order also to give you the possibility uh, to ask me some more questions, um, let me um, basically briefly tell you that um, that we are transposing those ideas uh, also to other domains. In particular, we right now work on introducing shared session types with resource analysis in digital contracts. And uh, then let me finish up and take questions. I'm um, basically just showing here on the slide where you, the papers you can read up on the work I've presented. Perfect. Let's all thank Stephanie for the wonderful keynote. I have the mic. Thank you. It's a very good talk. I really enjoyed it. Um, I'm wondering if we just solved the problem of um, uh, protocol adherence and uh, race conditions. But don't we introduce concurrency, sorry, not concurrency, scalability problem, because we now have locking on the whole resources or channels. How will it scale? Okay, so um, that's a very good question. Uh, and I, I think I understand why you're asking this, because yes, as you observed, we now have to lock the entire process, right? But the key is also to observe that there are those external and internal choices. So even though we lock the entire process, we only lock it for a duration of the protocol. So it's not basically, um, that, that can be a very quick exchange, right? So, so that's, that's one answer. Um, the other thing is uh, one could, of course, uh, try and see whether there's any way of adopting a lock-free approach, like there's like lock-free data structures. But that's something I would like to work on in future work. I haven't uh, thought about it further anymore. But uh, I mean, right now we are doing basically a pessimistic approach to concurrency. And I think, I imagine it's possible to basically take those ideas and go with an optimistic approach and look basically at log-free data structures. Yeah. But it's uh, essentially really important to observe that the, it's, it's really only the acquire release point which can be just um, a relative short exchange in the protocol because we have several, we have external choice, right? There are several branches and you only lock for one of the branches essentially. Okay. Thank you, Stephanie. We're going to have a break um, now and please everyone come back around 1010. We're going to have the, the, another talk after that. Um, if you have any questions about the keynote, please feel free to approach Stephanie. Thank you.